Good morning to everyone. I am pleased to be here in Austin to once again join the world's leading stakeholders in the digital assets industry. Over the past decade, significant developments and volatility in the global fintech and digital asset space have necessitated the establishment of robust and appropriate regulations to support innovation, foster best practices, and create international legislative standards that, product, that protect the markets, investors, and the financial system. Regulatory frameworks around the world are constantly evolving and the Bahamas will continue to lead and set the standard in this regard. Upon coming to office in late 2021, my administration embraced the challenge of identifying emerging trends in the financial services, recognizing that traditional financial services products were becoming endangered species and failed to embrace the freedom and inclusion that the public demanded. We quickly understood that the digital asset space had much potential to fill the needs left unmet by traditional finance and to truly democratize financial markets. Embracing this potential, we began to look at the innovative ways of ch channeling our strengths in a long-standing financial services industry in order to bring regulatory clarity to the emerging digital assets industry. We moved expeditiously to create a digital asset sector policy in consultation with industry stakeholders, as well as establishing the Digital Assets Advisory Panel comprised of industry practitioners, leading experts, and is chaired by my, attorneys, my country's Attorney General, Ryan Pinder, who will be here with me today. This panel is mandated to assess industry and provide responses to trends keeping, up, keep, keeping us ahead of the curve in the industry. As indicated in our sector policy statement, we want a robust regime that protects investors and facilitates industry innovation and development. When I addressed you at last year's gathering, I posited that the Bahamas can and should be home to digital asset businesses because of its robust regulatory framework and legal regulatory clarity. Our ongoing work to effectively evaluate industry, industry trends and respond to emerging risk is compelling evidence of that position. This, this includes the Bahamas attaining a compliant rating on the Financial Action Task Force Recommendation 15 for the technical compliance of its virtual asset service providers anti-money laundering supervisory framework. This achievement of the regulatory framework within the Digital Assets and Registered Exchange Act, commonly referred to as the DARE Act, also signals that the Bahamas is legislatively equipped to mitigate and combat the risk of money laundering, as well as terrorist and proliferation financing associated with new and emerging technologies. This was critical to the Bahamas achieving a perfect 40 out of 40 rating with the FATF recommendations and I might add, only six countries globally have achieved this milestone. The Government of the Bahamas and the Securities Commission of the Bahamas are committed to advancing the most current regulatory policies that safeguard and protect investors, customer assets, and industry stakeholders, while enabling leg leg legitimate digital asset businesses to innovate and grow in a risk-based environment. Since DARE's enactment, the Commission has continually sought industry feedback, have internal reviews, and sought international assessments of the legislative regime. The Commission's continuous and proactive monitoring of the digital asset sector includes the ongoing evaluation of international regulatory advancements, as well as benchmarking the DARE Act with comparable frameworks from jurisdictions such as the European Union, Hong Kong, and New York. Consequently, and in light of lessons learned, during the so-called crypto winter of 2022, the Commission identified aspects of the Act that require consideration, and in April of 2022, began consolidating its ongoing review of the Act. 
to address legislative gaps, ambiguities, and procedural concerns that were influenced by emerging trends. I am pleased to advise that on Tuesday of this week, the Securities Commission opened its one-month public consultation period for a series of amendments to the DARE Act. The amendments will address a comprehensive range of dig digital asset activities and strengthen protection mechanisms for the registration and ongoing supervision of operators. They represent an even greater focus on consumer and investor protection, robust risk management, as well as market development and innovation. Let me highlight that the process of developing proposed amendments to the DARE Act began in April of last year before and not after or as a result of the events that led to the 10th of November 2022 collapse of FTX. The Securities Commission of the Bahamas, as well as law enforcement authorities in the Bahamas, are actively investigating the events that led to FTX's collapse. Due to the wide range of jurisdictions in which FTX operated and the size and scope of its business activities, the investigation is complex and continuing. We should not comment or speculate on those, on those investigations. Any view, however, that events which led to the FTX collapse are tied to a weakness in the Bahamas legislative structure is not consistent with the facts. Indeed, it was the strength of the DARE Act that enabled the Bahamas to act first and act decisively on FTX with the Securities Commission quickly putting the Bahamas-based entity into provisional liquidation ahead of their filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and securing FTX assets, which had a market or trading value of around $3.5 billion at the time they were secured. U.S. debtors in the Chapter 11 themselves credited the Bahamian regulatory framework in the securing of these assets. The Act, the DEAR Act, is the superior regulatory legislation in the industry. The current amendments will keep the Bahamas at the forefront of digital asset regulation globally, including enhanced visitor, enhanced investor protection mechanisms, new requirements for digital asset businesses and exchanges, and provisions for the registration and issuance of digital assets, including stable coins. Amendments also include additional requirements for custody and custodial wallet services, more prescriptive se segregation of client assets requirements, and an internationally compliant anti-money laundering framework. New areas of digital asset businesses will be addressed by the DARE amendments. Examples include management of digital assets, digital asset derivative services, and distributed ledger technology network node services. Operators of a digital asset exchange must ensure the systems and controls used in its activities are adequate and appropriate for the scale and nature of its businesses. Continuing, our jurisdiction's leadership in digital asset regulation, the DARE amendments introduced a first of its kind dedicated disclosure regime that captures staking of digital assets belonging to clients or the operation or management of a staking pool as a business. I encourage you all to read the consultative document which can now be found on the Securities Commission of the Bahamas website to get a good summary. Your input is welcome. For now, I'll just highlight a couple more. For custodians of digital, digital assets or, cust or custodial wallet services, the amendments will provide a single framework for registration, ongoing oversight and enforcement, requiring the businesses to be registered as a digi digital asset business, as well as requirements for segregation of assets. The DEAR amendments establish a new regulatory framework for stable coins. The amendments provide a clear definition for stable coins for the registration of existing stable coins, specific acceptable forms of reserve assets, and establishes new requirements for custody, management, segregation, reporting, and redemption of reserve assets. 
We have not stopped innovating. I'm pleased to announce that our digital advisory panel, chaired by the Attorney General, as mentioned, is collaborating with the Securities Commission of the Bahamas to develop a regulatory framework and corporate structure for Digital Autonomous Organization, or DAOs, to structure and operate with predictability and legal certainty. We will roll out this new regulated structure for DAOs in conjunction with the enactment of the DARE amendments. The Bahamas, as a leading jurisdiction in the financial services sector, possesses the human capital to facilitate and execute digital assets related services, such as asset management and wallet services, together with other businesses in the digital asset space that naturally serve the marketplace. As you can see, we have no means loss. We have not lost our zeal for being at the forefront of the digital asset industry. We remain determined to set the pace for and lead from the front in regulatory advancement and innovation. In keeping with our determination, I'm pleased to invite you to join us for the D3 Bahamas FinTech and Web3 Summit this fall. We are excited to bring together industry leaders from around the globe to delve into topics that matter most to the entire digital assets industry, such as the future of Web3 development, global regulatory advancements, crypto adoption, and sustainable finance powered by blockchain technology. We are creating an overarching legislative framework for digital assets and digital asset businesses that provide specific features for investor protections, robust risk management, and market development, while allowing room for legit legitimate digital asset businesses to operate, innovate, and grow in the Bahamas. When it comes to the digital asset sector, we are open for business. And when you are looking for a jurisdiction where you can confidently invest, look no further than the Bahamas. I thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. So, uh, Prime Minister Davis will now be joined on stage by uh, Ryan Pinder, who is the Attorney General of the Bahamas and knows the digital asset industry there really quite intimately. Uh, and the two of them will be interviewed by Ian Allison. Ian, of course, is the second award winner of our Polk Award that we have a habit of promoting to you. He uh, knows this situation quite deeply as well. So, please welcome to join the Prime Minister, Ian Allison and Attorney General Ryan Pinder. I'm over here. He's going to sit here. Hello. My name's Ian Allison, reporter with CoinDesk, and I'm so honoured, you know, to be here today with uh, Prime Minister Davis and Attorney General Ryan Pinder, uh, you know, to to talk about. Uh, you know, the Bahamas and all things Bahamian uh, regarding digital assets. And I just wanted to sort of preamble to start off by saying, you know, I interviewed Sam Bankman Fried back in 2018, and he just struck me as a decent chap, a very passionate, a very uh, kind of, he spoke very quickly. I didn't understand everything he said. <laughs> but, you know, I, all, all around a good guy, right? And what, what it appears now is that he became latterly sort of adept at kind of pulling the wool over the eyes of politicians, the media, venture capitalists. I mean, it came as a surprise when this, you know, uh, exchange collapsed. I mean, I, I wrote the story and it was a surprise to me. And I just wondered if, you know, to ask you to start off with Prime Minister, do you feel that he was disingenuous towards you guys when you first met him? Well, I would have met um, Sam 
Sam Bankman Freed about no more than four times during his stay in the Bahamas. And I, like you, um, yes. felt that he was altruistic. He was uh, passionate yes. uh, in what he's doing. Very smart, bright, and, um, and was very philanthropic in, in his work. And so, like I guess the whole world, it was a shock to discover that the, that the business had encountered the challenges that it did. Indeed. Um, and another kind of philosophical almost question. I mean, would you guys rather this man had stayed in Hong Kong or he'd gone somewhere else and you'd never in engaged with him? Or has it been worth it, you know, overall? No, well, uh, I think, you know, I, I don't like to, you know, um, like the Monday morning quarterback is always right. Um, I don't think we would have done anything differently than what we did. Um, in fact, um, he put my, my jurisdiction on a map in this space. Uh, it is him coming to the Bahamas that inspired, or FTS coming to the Bahamas that inspired me as a leader of the country to look at this space, to see that this is an innovative um, space that could add, add value to my, to my financial services industry, which was being challenged because, as I indicated in my speech, a number of the financial products will become an endangered species because of the manner in which the global uh, community were viewing what I call offshore jurisdictions. And we were considered an offshore jurisdiction in this space. And so we were, along with the, my attorney general, um, also looking for ways and means of ensuring that the human capital that we would have developed over the many years being in the financial services industry were not just waylaid and furloughed with nothing to do. And we saw this as an opportunity to, for them to be engaged in something new and innovative. Lovely, lovely. So, so um, I don't think I could say that we regretted them coming at all. Sure, sure thing. Um, I, I was going to ask, now I know there's a limit to what you can say about the things that are in bankruptcy, things that are happening there, but I'll go through this really quickly. Um, I just wanted to ask, what would a reasonable resolution of the current jurisdictional debate look like to you guys, if you could give us sort of an opinion on that? Maybe right. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that principally, um, the Bahamas is a country of the rule of law, and we respect law, and we respect the legal process. And as indicated uh, by the Prime Minister and his contribution, um, our legislative and regulatory regime allowed us to demonstrate that the Bahamas respects the rule of law when we immediately stepped in um, and the regulator had put the entity in provisional liquidation. Um, what does a success look like for the Bahamas uh, in the context of a significant failure in the market? Uh, well, the orderly liquidation uh, of the entity uh, to maximize the benefit back to clients. That's ultimately what a regulatory framework is intended to do. Um, and, and we're very confident that the uh, liquidation procedures and the process underway in the Bahamas in the courts, supervised by the courts, uh, will, will result in maximum benefit uh, to the clients of FTS. Good, good. Is, is there, have the Bahamian court made any rulings regards the status of the funds that you seized? The well, the funds are held by uh, the Securities Commission of the Bahamas, the regulator, and the regulator was empowered by the DARE Act uh, to take such action. Uh, now, because the entity is in provisional liquidation, that is um, really overseen by the court system in the Bahamas. So the courts would have the ultimate say on the disposition of those assets. Uh, fundamental to that is identifying the clients and, and whose assets they are. And obviously, it's a very complex uh, liquidation. Uh, but, but that's the process. The process is court supervised um, in the process of the judicial liquidation okay. um, overseen and held by the Securities Commission. I might, might I just add to um, our jurisdiction is no stranger to huge, large liquidations or failures of mega companies. We've gone through it before, yeah. uh, and, and we have proven that our regime and the efficacy of what happens in these matters 
work. And ultimately, uh, the debtors and customers who are, who are more adversely exposed to, to, to damage or, and loss are usually protected in this, in this area. And so, so, so sometimes I was a bit, for example, I was a bit disappointed that, that, that you're having, as it were, a pair of tension between what is going on in the United States and what is going on in the Bahamas when in fact the ultimate aim of this is to see how we could make customers whole and to see whether or not, for example, there's, there's room to, because we're talking about the commodity coins uh, and maybe the loss is in the value of the coins going up and down, whether we can identify the owners of these coins and see whether we could perhaps have the platform back up and running. But that's a matter for the liquidators yeah. and the court to determine. Good, good. And in the last panel, there's, they were talking about the possibility that FTX may restart, right? Which is, you know, yeah. it, we, well, the liquidation behind... is provisional, which allows that option yeah. um, if there is value to the creditors sure. to do so. And so and the Bahamas would be the appropriate place yeah, for that to happen. Yes. Well, we certainly believe so. Yeah, yeah. Is that likely, do you think? Well, that's a question of the provisional liquidators and their assessment of the value of relaunching any platform. Really, really good. Um, talking about exchanges relocating, recently in the news, Coinbase, and now you, you, you guys will be close with the, Baham, the, the Bermuda chaps, and you probably talked to them about it. Um, Coinbase moving their offshore base to Bermuda, does that kind of strengthen you, your guy's hand or does that feel that maybe weakens your hand in any way? I don't know. No, we, don't, we don't think it weakens our hand. I mean, any, uh, however the space grows, sure. I think any, of our, any jurisdiction that's in the space good. grows when it's good for all uh, yeah. jurisdiction. And so, you know, we, we applaud Bermuda to be able to attract Coinbase there and we wish them well. And, and, and I think there's no need to, to worry about, I don't think it weakens either of our hands. I think it just strengthens it. Got, got I, it. To put this in slightly different terminology as well, do you think that the clampdown in the US on crypto that's happening right now is going to be good for you guys or going to be bad for you guys? Well, you know, my opinion is I think it's all a function of being able to respond from a regulatory point of view to the industry. You know, it's no secret that the digital assets industry is a quickly evolving, fast moving industry. And I think one of the advantages that um, countries like ours, Bermuda and others have is that we're small and we're legislatively nimble. As, as demonstrated by the overview of the proposed amendments to our regulatory framework, we can advance those in a rather expeditious way yeah. where when you look at uh, the struggles of larger countries, you bring up the United States, but I don't think they're alone in this. Um, the struggles of larger countries to actually formulate a regulatory framework that makes sense uh, versus smaller countries who are nimble to react to a fast moving market. I, I think that's the key distinction when you look at um, proper jurisdictions and yeah. regulatory jurisdictions for this business. Lovely. Can I? Sorry, you're going to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, the, the theme here is, to, is regulatory regime. And, uh, and um, it is unfortunate that when a regulated entity fails, um, the first cut, the culprit appears to be, uh, or, or fingers are pointed at the regulatory regime. Well, you know, do I point my finger at the regulatory regime for the failure, say, for example, the SFB, the Silicon Valley Bank that failed? or a signature bank that failed, or Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. Sure. They, they also operate within a regulatory regime. And, and so I think you don't want, because recalling that this space is new, there's still a lot of lobby that is not embracing yes. this, and, and there's still an uphill battle to getting people to, to embrace it as they should. And, and, and I would not exclude the banking, in the banking lobby in this regard. You, you're going to continually have to move away. It's not just a regulatory dream. It's just the players in the game that we need to continue to be vigilant of. 
Can I ask real quick, uh, do, is there a, have you got a lot of crypto companies, crypto funds based in Bahamas? Sorry. So, I mean, we continue to see new licensees under the DARE Act, even after uh, November, the events of November of last so year. There wasn't so a pullback. They, they, we haven't witnessed a pullback. In fact, we've seen um, a, a lot of enthusiasm amongst the licensees, especially with our proposed amendments, how we're addressing issues such as stable coins, staking, how we're addressing issues such as creating a framework for DAOs to regulate and operate from within the Bahamas in a predictable and legal fashion. Those are the types of things that make the jurisdiction attractive and allow the participants in the Bahamas, the licensees, um, to have enthusiasm that we're actually keeping pace with the industry that they're participating in. Lovely. Um, and in the new rules, in the DARE update, you're going to look at things like stable coins, stuff like that. Can I ask, having had the experience of a very large on paper crypto company that turned out to be quite opaque, falling to pieces, does, is there red flags? Are you seeing red flags, for example, with the relationship between Tether? the stablecoin and Dell Tech Bank, because that, they, they've got quite a close relationship. I don't know if you can talk about that at all. Well, I mean, I think um, really, you know, when you talk about stablecoins, by definition, a stablecoin has to have a close relationship with a financial yes. institution, because yeah. by definition, they hold reserves that are backing up the stablecoin. Will there be more we scrutiny? We don't have any, of, pardon me? Will there be more scrutiny of things Well, like if Dell you Tech? look at the, if, well, I don't think that, that's up to the central bank as a regulator, but if you look at the amendments that we are proposing, we're proposing that the reserves backing stablecoins, yeah, yeah. they have to be segregated. So they're now in a segregated regime with annual reporting that is signed off by accountants to verify that it is at least a one-to-one -one reserve on those. Uh -huh. um, and, and the custodians that are holding uh, digital assets are now under a new regulatory regime where they likewise have to have segregation of digital yes. assets and client assets from their own operating assets Good. and have a very um, distinct and uh, aggressive reporting framework that they're going to have to give to the regulator. So, so, so that is that is a clear position that we've taken in our um, amendments, yes. um, and that's what the regulatory framework of the Bahamas well, is going to look like. Just one last question on Dell Tech: Is, is it true that uh, Tether has an ownership stake in them? iPhoenix, they, they own part of Dell Tech, right? Not that I'm uh, no, I, not, not that we're aware of. The, the, you can go uh, off the record uh, if you want. Just forget them. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, any change in ownership stake of an entity has to come to the government to of the Bahamas. Government. And, and, and that has not come to the government of the Bahamas. Um, you guys deserve a lot of credit for being the first people to really have a, CN, uh, a central bank digital currency, the sand dollar, in operation. Has, has the events of FTX, you know, affected the sand dollar project? Or, you know, has it been detrimental to it, adoption and so on? No, well, so, yeah, I can. Answer. The sand dollar. No, no. The answer to your question is no. No. Good. Um, the government and the central bank are very aggressive um, in promoting the adoption of the sand dollar as a digital currency in the Bahamas. And, and you know, the Bahamas is unique. Um, unlike many countries, we're an archipelagic country. Uh, mm -hmm. We have 26, 27 islands that are inhabited. Uh, our banking system and our financial system. Um, the, the movement to online banking has dismantled some bricks and mortar um, offerings to our people throughout the archipelago. And so we see the sand dollar as an empowering financial instrument, an empowering currency a lot of people uh, to are the using development of our country. People are using um, it. They're, 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 they're slowly adopting it. The central bank has just released a very aggressive adoption plan uh, that they've published yeah. to be able to widely distribute and, uh, and provide incentives for usage and adoption. Lovely. Last, real quick, because we're just on time here. Is it possible, can, can you quantify the financial impact to the island of FTX? I mean, they, I know that they dropped quite a lot of money. Is, has it been, has it affected your kind of GDP? No, our GDP no, no, no. is no. probably no, no. growing faster than it has growing. in the recent years. L yeah. Listen, I just want to wish you guys the absolute best with your new rules and they go smoothly and it's, I think you've reacted very positively. Yeah, yes, and thank you. And as I mentioned in my, in my opening statement, um, you can visit the Securities Exchange our website. We have, we, are, we have published the proposed amendments um, and before we take it to Parliament and, 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 and have it enacted, we would like to have 
feedbacks from the industry to see whether or not we are covering the things that impact the industry. I, I always have a view in governance that whatever we do, we need to know how it's impacting the persons affected by it. So this call for you to, to give feedback is genuine and we wish that you do so. On that, uh, when you go on the website, you'll find um, an email address to which you can give your comments and they'll be taken serious by the technical team led by the chairman of the advisory committee and we would definitely give considerations to your input. Yeah. So. Well, listen, I just want to say everyone, a big round of applause for being such good sports and coming on and answering questions. Thank you. Thank you.